Hi, everybody. Sorry for that slight delay. I was having a little bit of YouTube <laughs> problems here, just challenges. First time I'm doing this live situation here. So uh, we're going to do some saxophone work, alto saxophone work here. And if you don't mind, just give me some comments in the comment area. If uh, the sound is um, not great or if there's too much, I'm trying to adjust the microphone levels a little harder for me with the saxophone than it was with the clarinet. So if my speaking volume or the playing is too much on the, the volume, just please put a comment in there for me. So we're going to go ahead and just take a quick peek at, uh, we're looking at the Fairling 48 studies. And um, for alto saxophone this year for the KMEA Allstate, we're looking at uh, number 33 and number 42. So let's take a peek at number 33 first, okay? Uh, so what we have in number 33, uh, we're going to start at bar nine. And so the first thing is an, is an open B flat, which is the same as a C sharp. So if you're not sure about notes, uh, the open, all of the, the keys open is a C sharp or a D flat. And harmonic equivalent is what they call that. Um, so what I like to do is maybe get my tuner out to check where my open D flat is and my high D flat. And my high D flat will more than likely be a bit sharp. So I'm going to try to put my camera down a little bit here and just get it on my hands. I'm going to try to put my, I'll, I'll pull my tuner up here so you can see. Oh, and by the way, I didn't mention this in the clarinet one earlier, but there's two apps that I'm really uh, fond of. One is called Clear Tune, which has a really great visual tuner like this. And the other one that I like quite a bit is called um, Tonal Energy Tuner. And on that has a, a fantastic metronome with, with infinite possibilities. Uh, so for, for this case though, for now, just to check myself, I have it on clear tune and I'm gonna take a look at my uh, open D flat. Now, some of the saxophones might be slightly flat on that note. And so there's an option for that. Uh, so this is a common thing for that particular note. Put your G key down and your octave key down. So instead of this, so uh, that's what I tend to use there. Uh, let's see. Um, oh, I forgot one thing. Let me grab this out of my clarinet case because I, I use it for, it's a ligature. So uh, this is actually a, a wonderful ligature that I've been using on my alto saxophone and I keep forgetting to uh, order another one. Uh, this is a, a, a ligature that I use by a friend of mine, Alberto, in Italy, and it's called a Zach ligature. And it makes quite a difference uh, for me for my, my, on my sound and response, I find. So, and the one that I'm using for the clarinet seems to fit my alto saxophone mouthpiece quite well. So I just often use them interchangeably and sometimes I just forget to change them back and then I uh, but uh, equipment is another thing we'll, we'll kind of talk about briefly here a little bit. But So um, I can have this fingering here like this. And then when I go to play my high D flat, that tends to be sharp. So I'm going to play it as open here with the octave key as I would normally, but Put my right hand one two three down not the pinky but just the one two three so instead of this and that will really bring it down and the rest is what they call voicing which is uh, the way we shape our tongue and the way we essentially hear the note and once we hear the note in our mind a little bit all of this will uh with some training of a tuner and an audible sound will gradually get us to, to learn to predict what the, the notes are shaped like and feel like um, that's talk for another time because I didn't want to get too much into that. I wanted to play more of this a bit and, and just answer some questions if you had any questions. But linked below in the description of this YouTube live video are some uh, basic videos about sa saxophone sound production. Uh, I also have some uh, videos of this year uh, of playing through it. I worked through it and, and just mini lessons, but also performances of both etudes. So please go down and check those out. There's some uh, saxophone warmups in there and a, a link to some other playlists. So hopefully that's a, a few resources down below to get you started. So um, let's get started here. We'll do some opening on bar nine and we're looking at, I'm just going to get to check, double check on my tempos. So uh, number 33 should be played uh, 
eighth note equals 72 to 80. So um, let's go ahead and put it at 72 and see what that sounds like. And remember, this is the eighth note. Okay, so now the eighth note means that the first on bar nine, it's a dotted um, quarter note, which normally would be counted as one and two and three, four. But in this case, a dotted quarter note has three eighth notes. The, eight, the quarter note has two of them and the dot is half of a quarter note, so that's three. So I should be counting the first bar as one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. <laughs> This piece, I think for the most part, I'm trying to remember if there's one spot we don't use it. For, I use the biz key. So there are three ways to finger a B flat on the saxophone. One, two on the left hand, the side B flat key like this, the side lower key here. So that's one way. Another way is hitting the B key, but putting your finger in between to see both, to have both keys covered down like that. So that's the second way. And that's the way I use in this, that's the fingering I use quite a bit in this particular piece. Um, the third way is a one and one Not used quite as much. The pitch is not always 100% uh, accurate. So I use this fingering, the biz key for flat scales, like F major. And then for B flat. And so... It, it's very easy to get to. You don't have to coordinate any other hands. So in this key, we have four flats, which is the key of A flat major. And although that may sound like it's a lot of, uh, it's, uh, it's concert C flat, uh, it sounds like it's a lot of flats. It really works well on the saxophone. It's very comfortable. So slowly. <laughs> some links down below to some scale exercises please go back in there and practice your scales they're not only are they valuable but they'll, they'll make everything else feel much easier and much more fun when you play your music uh, so the, so i wanted to kind of make sure we talk about the fingerings the three options for b flats i wanted to make sure that we really do emphasize that biz is going to be the main one to use in this particular piece uh, i also wanted to emphasize the the idea of pitch and intonation particularly on the high notes. So it's good for you to keep your tuner available to you. Um, I'll do it one more time and I'll keep my tuner on the whole time just to kind of watch my pitches. And so if I say, go into uh, from bars 10 into 11. And that's with my one, two, three, right, uh, right hand down. That helps quite a bit. Um, vibrato. How do you play vibrato on the saxophone? So what I do is I uh, say with my air and my lower lip jaw, slight movement. I say essentially wah-wah, but only mainly with the lower lip sort of pressuring the reed ever so slightly. Wah, 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 wah. And a good way to practice vibrato is to put your metronome on. And so if we pick, say, a, a speed of 60 uh, and just do quarter notes, eighth notes, triplets, sixteenths, and that's a good way to train yourself to to get some control ultimately vibrato should be very natural sounding and so you want to uh, really listen to some singers beautiful opera singers um and when you listen to singers uh, singing the, the, the phrasing, you, you'll, have, you'll find that the vibrato changes speed. It may start the note out with nothing and then gradually get faster and faster. Sometimes it stays uh, with nothing and very subtly puts in a vibration 
Also listen to wonderful violinists and cellists uh, as well. So oftentimes we have to listen to instruments beyond the saxophone to understand how we want to, uh, how we can get some tools developed to, to play musically. So if I play, <clears throat> let's see, uh, uh, from the beginning, bar nine, and we'll go up to say, let's, now we did 72 before. So if I go to a little bit faster, around 80, it'll be like this. And so that's a little bit of vibrato. It's absolutely acceptable to have no vibrato on this. And the grace note, don't accent it. Just let it come right before the beat. Bata, 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 like that, very gentle. Um, remember to count in bar 10, uh, 11 rather, one and three and four and because all its eighth note is getting a beat um, in bar. Let's see, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13 should be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, lolly, eight, lolly, or seven, ta, te, two, te, te, ta. Uh, lots of different syllables for these triplets. Uh, I like to actually to say one, seven, two, three, eight, two, three. I, me, for me personally, the numbers are the most comfortable, um, but we have lots of different systems that people different use, uh, use differently. So from the beginning. attention to one thing before I went on too far. Uh, you may find that you're having a sort of like a, a gurgly sound, a little bit of a sort of saliva E type sound. And if that happens, you're look, what you're trying to look for is a place in your music where you can sort of withdraw that from the mouthpiece. So like that. And that would be a place where you would also probably need to breathe as well. So do kind of plan for that. Uh, so be sure that when you choose your tempo, you're going to say if you choose 80, you're going to have exact locations to put your breaths in. And, and I think I talked about that in the videos that I made down below. They're linked below. Um, do practice those locations to breathe, to, to put those breaths in. And when you practice, sometimes you may not need to actually take the air in. You may need to actually sort of clear the mouthpiece out. I find this more and more in the saxophone and sometimes if you don't plan ahead for it, you can get caught and you end up having kind of a gurgly sound. So I, that happened to me in a moment ago and I just wanted to kind of call attention to that. Accents should be leaned on, but whenever we have any markings in the music, we're always wanting to sort of understand the overall stylistic context. So if we did this, it's too much. It's out of the character of the style of this music. So as long as those accents are slightly louder, I think you'll get the point across. Um, one thing I'm intentionally trying to do sometimes is not keep my dynamic too static. So again, I sort of just push a little bit more crescendos, a little bit crescendo. So if I, for instance, on bar uh, 11, I'm crescendoing very so, ever so slightly down to that E flat. And then I gently tongue the A flat by having the tip of my tongue touch the tip of the reed, T, T, T. I didn't quite make
make a decrescendo there as marked. Let me do that a little better. <laughs> probably an idea for us is because I didn't make the decrescendo properly because it's in the music and we want to do what's here in other, in other words whoever's evaluating you on your audition will actually be looking at the music so in order to make that decrescendo effective I have to be loud enough to start with so two bars before that or the bar before that on my high D flat is marked as forte and I'm going to probably do some shaping with my dynamics, but make sure that I don't come down too soft yet uh, so that when I have that last fourth beat uh, on 10, 11, 12, on bar 12, I have some room to come down. So let me try that again one more time from the high D flat. sort of small decrescendo on that C instead of clipping it with my tongue. So just a nice uh, start the tongue. Uh, let's see. I'm slurring into it. So and across all of those, I'm hearing sort of two lines. The A flat is staying in the uh, sort of the same line here, and the bottom line is climbing little by little. And in the music, it says the crescendo. So I'm trying to get the energy built up little by little. And by the time I get to my F, now I'm really at the arrival point, and in the music, it's marked as forte. So. And remember, eighth note is getting a beat. So those triplets are just triplet, triplet, seven, eight, seven, two, three, eight, two, three, seven, two, three, eight, two, three. Okay, good. Let's do the cadenza. So the cadenza should be played kind of as written. In other words, you have 30 second notes for a series of notes, eight of them, and then another group of four 30 seconds, and then you have a group of six 16th notes. So we're not going to need the metronome for this. The way I, predict, I find cadenzas work uh, useful to not get sort of finger tied is if I were to uh, group them. So let me group the first four notes, the second four notes, which are all beamed together. So that's very straightforward. That's one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one. Now we can choose to start the cadenza very fast and then slow it down. Or we can start it slow and speed it up. And so what I would suggest is to try to practice a lot of different ways. Um, let me play the entirety of the cadenza. So I think there's a few things we have to consider. Number one, uh, if you're, <laughs> this is a sort of a side, but it's a technical thing. If your instrument is not responding well, some of the low notes are not speaking easily, particularly the low C, but really the low B flat and the low B here and the low C sharp, that means your instrument might need to get repaired. And I would say now, like as in now, bring it to a very good repair technician so that you can get the instrument working well down in the low register. The E flat there is a reasonably low note. <laughs> If that note is not responding well, then you're going to kind of work your way down in this cadenza and get a little stuck because the note won't want to come out and you won't have the control to play the tempos that you would like to play. Um, the second thing I, I guess we could talk about is that it's not written in the music, but it feels to me like a, a nice way of coming into that E flat is with a little bit of a retard. So if nothing else, stretch that last F. gently go down in there and I also made a slight day crescendo. Now that's one option. What about if, if you choose a different option, that's okay. We kind of, like I said earlier, start slow and get fast into all of it. Let's see if that might work. And by the way, we have the comments here, I think, and I hope this is enabled. This is the first time I've done a YouTube live video. So 
please write some comments in here with any questions. I'm trying to keep on the, an eye on the comment area. Uh, please let me know if there are any questions at all. So we're, let's try to go slow to fast with a big crescendo and see if, we, if that will work phrasing wise. <laughs> but it's just like a big barrage of fast notes. The quarter note triplets, I call them quarter note triplets. Um, so let me see what is someone saying here. Oh. Thank you, Mrs. Miss Amy Spears is, is an amazing uh, 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 middle school and, and high school teacher here in Bowling Green, Kentucky, and, and she's fantastic. Uh, one of my former students and one of my very dear friends, actually, which is great. Um, so uh, lots of options. I guess one of the things that I, I wonder sometimes about a, a college professor working with students is that oftentimes students come from music programs where you're learning to play your instrument initially. And so you learn rules basically. And my rules are to, to sort of just get the person to, or my, my single rule is to get the person to become independent, an independent thinker and a creative thinker with some good fundamental skill sets going on. So an understanding of counting rhythms, understanding of fingerings on the instrument and understanding of getting a good controlled sound, vibrato, colors of sound on the saxophone. When we can develop all those things, and they're always, as by the way, a continued development of those things, um, what we would, I want to encourage creativity so that you can stand out in an audition or in your band program and, and really stand out. So let's, uh, so again, that's why I'm kind of experimenting with the different variations of the uh, cadenza. <laughs> Kind of settle on that. That's about what I'm thinking might work. Um, if I put my metronome on, now that's the eighth note, and if I play triplets, let's pick a note like this, a C. And if I think of uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, and if I tie the one and the two together, and the three and the four together, and the five and the six together, and I get one, two, three, five, six, one, two, Three, five, six. Here's my B. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, five, six. One, two, three, five, six. That's what essentially uh, the, these this big six eighth note right after the end of the cadenza, the bar after our cadenza is. So those are written as eighth note triplets, two of them in a row with a big beam on the bottom that says six. It's essentially two eighth note triplets. But since an eighth note is getting a B, it's like what we know of as quarter note triplets. And those can be really confusing to count. So the way I like to start those is to just pick the first note of the group. So in this case, it's the C. And I just like to play groups of triplets on that note. And then if I can talk in my head and say to myself, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. And let me slow our tempo down a little bit on this. So if I say... Uh, now I change my uh, the notes, and if I can, uh, let's go back. Um, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six. Let's change our notes. Uh, so let me see if we go. So essentially, what I'm trying to say is we keep the same speed of those triplets that we were doing, but now we change the notes, and instead of every three, it's only two. It's like when I said one, two, three, four, five, six, one, three, five. One, three, five. And the four is where the other click is. So if you take the time to work that out little by little on your own with your metronome, without your metronome, using your foot, using your voice, using your mind to think it through, when you get to this, uh, a passage like this, it should work out just nicely. Um, okay, let's go over to the other one. So we'll kind of take a peek at this other one, which I will say that, and this is number uh, 40, let's see. So, um, I'm looking on my list here, 42. So by and large, when I listen to students playing all state music, uh, they 
tend to play the fast etudes. There's always a slow lyrical etude and a faster etude. And the students tend to focus a lot on the fast etude and not as much on the slower etude. And uh, in the times that I've judged all state auditions, sometimes that comes across to me because I hear a lot of emphasis on the technical and not quite as much emphasis on the sound. So do spend some time. Uh, th by the way, I just wanna say that, and this is not just because Miss Amy Spears is on, online here, which is she, uh, she's amazing. I'm a big fan of hers, by the way, uh, is that the teaching that goes on that I see in Kentucky is, is really amazing. And, and what the reason I say that is because I see uh, an incredible enthusiasm and commitment from the students and the teachers, teachers driving their students all over the state to come to these various festivals that the various universities have. Uh, and so it's really inspiring every time I meet a student for the first time to see this, this sort of first enthusiasm they have. Um, so when I say making a comment about sound, please understand that's in the context of these students having some fantastic preparation. It's just that I always want more. I always want them to be as good as they can possibly be. And if I hear something really good, I want to try to help them even improve more. Um, in number 42, 42 is taken at a pretty fast tempo. And so uh, he is saying here, suggesting, uh, let me just... Yeah, 70 or faster. And 70 is when I learned this one to make the video, uh, if you look in the descriptions down below, all the links are hopefully are there if I didn't uh, mess that up. And uh, so that was a very, very fast. That took me quite a while to kind of work that back up again. That was years since I played this one this fast. So it's really kind of like a this one, two, three, four, six, or rather one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. And that's a, a very, very, very fast tempo. Um, let's talk through a couple of, I was going to say a few, but maybe just a couple technical things first. One, uh, throat B flat. Uh, I think clarinet, long day. Uh, biz B flat. Biz, biz B flat. Th through most of this piece, uh, there will be a, a C flat down towards the third from the end, third line from, um, from the end, which is the same as a B natural. So you'll have to use your side B flat. So again, we talked about the, the three B flats. Most of this piece will use the biz B flat. The second thing uh, is that we have two options for G flat or F sharp. And so one option is this. So like this, the other is a chromatic option here. And though it's, I'm just going to tell you my thinking as a saxophone player, not even just as a teacher, but as a saxophone player, my tendency is to look for fingerings that I don't have to think about as much. If I have to think even a split second, if the piece is really, really fast, then I might miss it. I might get behind. So in this piece, I practiced it both ways with the chromatic G flat here, like for instance, at the, um, I guess in the, in the fourth bar. <laughs> And it works just fine. So if I play that, it works just fine. You also, though, can flip over. And I find on the saxophone, it, it's a pretty forgiving instrument, unlike the clarinet where you have rings that you're having to cover. So as long as you're, you're attempting to get into the center of the pearl of the key with your finger, if you miss it a little bit, though, and you still get your finger down, the note still will, will activate. So... I found as I got faster and faster and faster with this one that I was sometimes missing with the chromatic. So I switched over to the, to the middle finger G flat and that seemed to work a little better for me. Let's kind of go through that slowly and then we'll kind of go piece by piece. Uh, the, even at a reasonable tempo, so say we pick uh, 50, 5 0. I'm giving a little bit of a dynamic bump for each bar a little bit. As we get faster and faster, maybe that becomes slightly less. But that feeling of one, yep, da, 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 leading into the downbeat of each bar does give us a sort of feeling of a forward motion. So again, 
do your fundamentals. Count with your metronome, count with your voice, think through the counting, look for fingerings, work on your sound, practice your scales, um, tap your foot. All of that though, do think music, uh, music all the time. Think phrasing, think of how it should be sounding. Oh, I forgot to mention this in the previous uh, YouTube live, the, the video that we were just doing with the clarinet. Uh, I like an app called uh, on the phone that I found is free for Android and uh, uh, Apple called Voice Record Pro. If I can think of remembering to do that, I'll put that in the description later when this finishes. And so what I would encourage you all to do is record yourself a lot, as much as possible, so you can sort of hear what's going on. Record yourself with your metronome. Uh, so you can put the metronome on the tonal energy tuner, then flip over to the Voice Record Pro app and start recording yourself and do passages and see what you sound like. Are you staying with the metronome? Are you doing dynamics? Sometimes with the dynamics, sometimes we think we're doing them, but they're not coming out as much as we, we think we're doing them. So you have to over-exaggerate them. Um, articulations. This piece has, it, depending on the tempo that you're playing, um, <clears throat> it has very few staccato notes. So the first note of the piece, for instance, and down uh, a little bit lower. So what I'm more emphasized or, or focused rather on is keeping my staccato or my articulation gentle so that I can begin uh, certain notes like the beginning, the beginning of the third and the fourth bar. <laughs> Just, just gently tongue the reed. T, 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 tip of the tongue to the tip of the reed. Um, let me see if we can. <clears throat> uh, okay, I think that's mostly it on the first part, the first couple lines. And that's a little bit of a chicky passage. So what I think on this, on the E flat is you're going to really... Uh... Now, some people may say that Oh, Dr. Spola told us to do this and th therefore it's okay. And I'm going to probably break a rule or two when I say this. But we form a saxophone embouchure. An embouchure can be in a general way if you say the letter V, like that. And the beginning of the letter V has the lower lip sort of touching the bottom teeth. And if you just begin the letter V like that, you have enough lip, enough of the red part of your lip covering the teeth to act as a cushion. And so that's pretty much all you need. And then you close the corners down. Your corners have to be firm enough to not leak air. That's without getting into any more detail about a saxophone embouchure right now. There's a link below, by the way, on saxophone sound. And I talk a lot more about all this. Um, what I'd like to say is that here's the thing that I wanted to say that maybe is something that maybe could be controversial is that it's okay to be a little flexible. It's okay to move stuff around just a little bit. So in this case, when we have a really large leap, number one, I'm really pushing my air and I'm articulating that low C, but the main thing is my air. And also I'm opening up a little bit on my embouchure. So it's not just the tongue it's the air and it's opening up ever so slightly. It's a combination. So what I would do is practice your low C. And get familiar with where that sound is, uh, resonate the sound for a while, and then just gradually practice your E flat down to your C. Oh, and by the way, I didn't mention this earlier. It, this is a sort of like little trick uh, popping this F key like this to get your low notes out. And so <clears throat> if you can get control of emitting your air at the same time you do the, the little uh, movement of the finger like this, so the air, air, and there's no tongue involved. Um, and then when you add your tongue, it doesn't become this bah, real big pop. So and there's the C, C flat, which is a B natural, and our side B flat there. Um, overall, it's marked as piano from that second part where I started, and it doesn't change dynamics. So again, like I said in the earlier piece, we're going to kind of do some little bit of 
pushing uh, towards the downbeats primarily. So little light crescendos, nothing too dramatic, okay? <laughs> And then something, okay, so we'll stop there for a second. Something to say on this little section here. These are arpeggios. And so in your uh, music study at this point, you may not have gotten up to the point of studying music theory, which means the key signatures. You've gotten certain levels of that, I'm sure, if you're in a band class now at this point. But uh, these are specific chords as they relate to the key signature. And so we have uh, in this bar here, a G flat, B flat, D flat. That's a four chord, which is a G flat major. Then the one chord. Then the five chord. So what I do in my music is I mark little Roman numerals four, one, five, so that I know them. And then I go back and practice my scales and my arpeggios little by little. And so in this case, we have a D flat major scale. And so I, I would recommend practice your scales. They're down below in the description box. I put a, a, a listing of some scales. Uh, I have some fantastic scale book recommendations. So if anybody's interested, uh, put a comment in here, give me some information, uh, you know, or contact me through Facebook or through my email at WKU, and I'll be happy to recommend some fantastic scale books for lots of different levels. Uh, you'll really get lost in them. They're fantastic. So let's keep going a little bit on these nice arpeggios. That's not enough air. Now I'm going to pop my little F key because I have a C flat, which is a low B, and use a good amount of air there. So I'm playing it pretty fast. Let me give it a nice slower tempo. That's probably another spot like we had earlier where we had an E flat to the C um, in the end of the first uh, second line. So again, we'll probably have to use a good amount of air to get that. Um, I wouldn't worry so, so much about making those, all those dotted notes really, really short as much as just practicing them, uh, just getting your tongue on the reed. Because as your tempo increases, the shortness will actually sort of just come uh, in, in the context. That's another spot here on this particular arpeggio in the G flat. Um, so, uh, again, thinking backwards about fingerings, I like to think simply on fingerings. So, if I have one that I'm, I know in this particular piece, for instance, that I'm going to rely on pretty comfortably, then I'll just stick with that one. And so, in this case, as I got when I was relearning this piece a while ago, as I got down to that point, I realized that I need to use that middle finger like that. So, as I kind of flip up and over, uh, on that because I can't use this this chromatic one then uh, the rest of them I started to kind of use that middle finger just again so I don't have to think so uh, <laughs> And this little last line is a tricky, tricky little line. Um, so the way I recommend practicing it is we're in three, four. We have six eighth notes in a bar. Forget that. It's grouped in fours. Just practice the groups of fours. So let's practice together. Okay, ready? Let's do this. Oh, and one other practice tip I like to do. 
I like to work backwards. So I start at the end, maybe say the last, all these little groups of fours, I start at the last one and work my way backwards. So here's the first one, let's see, maybe from the A natural. Let's start in the G natural before that. Now, absolutely, you have the option of using this chromatic key. I know I'm talking about it a lot. Uh, hopefully, people will remember that at the end of the day, uh, that you have these options. So because I was using the middle, I'm going to stick with that. One other thing that I, I wonder whether some people might think this is uh, too advanced. Oh, this is for college students to think about, not so much for uh, ninth and 10th graders. Uh, but I like to think about memorizing the music. So I think it's, it, you know, a lot of piano players do it because piano players, string players have a lot of physical patterns they're doing. Piano players can play movements in a, in a uh, chords uh, or even scale passages where it's very physical and they can physically feel the patterning on the keyboard. We don't have that as much, but Nevertheless, as musicians, the, the sooner we internalize, we put that music into our brains and our ears and in our fingers, the quicker we can get to the point of really making music. So why wait? Get started early. If you play a phrase and you make a mistake and you hear the mistake, okay, go back and look at it, what, what it was, fix it, try to relearn it. Um, so I would say look at passages with the intent of not just memorizing, but more learning them. Learning them where you don't have to look at the music. Let's put through the, the, the previous one. And that's the way I practiced this one, is I separated them out little by little. So let me give you one little sort of... Uh, version of that. And then I just continued like that. So um, let me see. I'll, I'll try to take one more minute left. Let me try to play it once through, see if I can get it, see if I can get my low C flat to speak. Uh, and then uh, if there are any questions, please, please ask a question in the chats below before I wrap up this YouTube live tonight. <clears throat> Um, oh, I think I said this earlier, but in the description below, in the videos that I made for this year's Allstate, uh, I tried to play this piece at a variety of tempos with the metronome and finally without the metronome. And there's actually a separate video that's really fast that I didn't <laughs> intend on making. But as I was practicing this one day and it kind of came out really fast, I thought, oh, maybe they'll want to hear it at a really fast tempo. It, you, you work your way up to these things. So gradually, as you're working this, stay slow. Get your precision on your articulation. Get all your fingerings precise, biz B flat, G flats, whichever one you decide to work on. Uh, by the way, take private lessons if possible. Find a teacher. That's the best way to improve on your instrument. I forgot to mention that earlier. So um, look at the videos below for more uh, information on these. So if we go up to say, uh, let's see what we're going to say. <laughs> Oh, one other quick thing. Those high notes, D flat is like a C sharp. F is one, two, three. All the three keys with the inside of your hand, I hit them from in here, here, and here. So like that. Okay, and I try to keep my hands close to the keys. So F is with these three plus this top key. And E flat is the back two. So this one here and this one here together. which by the way, I forgot to mention that, I should mention that now, more important than probably playing it, is that that's an area where you'll want to practice and stay up there a little bit practicing.
Okay, everybody, thank you so much. Uh, leave a comment below. Contact me through Facebook or through my email at Western. And I wish everybody good luck on your KBA Allstate auditions this year. Practice hard. Find a teacher. Buy some new reads. Please make sure you do that. Make sure you have some brand new reads to work with. Uh, get your instrument serviced by a good repair technician. I forgot to mention also having a good mouthpiece. I play on the Selmer Concept. I also love the Van Doren AL3s. And the Dario makes some superb mouthpieces as well. <coughs> so... Please go out there and find out, find some good equipment and practice hard. And I wish everybody good luck. Thank you.